Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of Robert Sylvester Kelly, what's going on in the federal Brooklyn appeal and federal Chicago trial. So today, um, I do have uh, some information on the actual motion that was filed and what was said in the file. I know it's a little bit late, but um, we're going to go ahead with it anyway. And let me see here. I am going to read the motion that was uh, filed August 30th, PDF from attorney Jennifer Bonjean. And it is United States of America versus Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid, and Milton Brown, also known as June Brown, to the Honorable Harry D. Lennon Weber, motion for judgment of acquittal pursuant to Federal Rule Criminal Procedure 29A. Now comes the defendant, Robert Sylvester Kelly, by and through his counsel, Jennifer Bonjean, and moves this court to enter a judgment of acquittal on each count each of the 13 count indictment. And basically what they're saying here is uh, that there wasn't enough evidence that was sufficient for um, what took place during this hearing. On February 13, 2020, the government filed a superseding indictment charging defendant with four counts of child exploitation Conduct that allegedly occurred in 1998 or 1999 on the docket number 93. Specifically, the indictment accuses defendant of engaging in explicit conduct with minor one for the purpose of producing four separate videos between 1998 and 1999. These are counts one through four. Counts six through eight of the indictment accuse defendant of conspiring to and then receiving those same videos or copies thereof in 2001, seven, um, in 2001 and 2007 in violation of uh, 2252A after the videos were allegedly taken from defendant. So this is back to this video, this famous video that has haunted everyone's life. During the course of this proceeding, and no one knows where the original tape is at. And so Bonjean is saying there is something specific going on here and she's trying to get to the bottom of it. So the superseding indictment further alleged that defendant committed four additional violations of USC 2422B. Specifically, the government contends the following, that between 97 and 2001, September, defendant did knowingly persuade, induce, entice, and coerce minor one, Jane, to engage in activity that con constituted aggravated criminal sexual abuse under Illinois law. This was count nine. That in the summer of 1996, defendant did knowingly persuade, entice, induce, and coerce minor three, Nia, to exchange in sexual activity that constituted aggravated criminal sexual abuse under Illinois law. This is count 10. Between 1999 and 2000, defendant did knowingly persuade, induce, entice, and coerce minor four to engage in sexual activity that constituted aggravated criminal sexual abuse under Illinois law, count 11. That between 1997 and 2001, defendant did knowingly persuade, induce, entice, and coerce minor five, Pauline, to engage in activities that constituted aggregated criminal sexual abuse under Illinois law. This is count 12. Between 1997 and 2000, defendant did knowingly persuade and entice minor six, Brittany, to engage in an activity that constituted aggravated criminal sexual abuse under Illinois law, count 13. So we know we have set out the platform of the four minors who are now adults who said that they feared, um, you know, to testify before because of coercion of Robert Sylvester Kelly. Well, there's an argument going on here. So Bonjean is saying 
in her argument, under Rule 29, it provides that after the government closes its evidence or after the close of all the evidence, the court of the defendant's motion must enter a judgment of acquittal of any offense that which the evidence is insufficient to sustain a conviction. This is under Federal Rule Criminal Procedure 29A. So there is a lot of things that must be filed under this motion because the evidence was not sufficient. It didn't sustain um, what others would expect a jury to convict Robert of. So let's go with A, count, counts one through four of the indictment, the child pornography count. A judgment of acquittal to counts as to counts one through four of the indictment must be granted where the government's evidence was insufficient as to each and every element of offense. First, government's evidence failed to demonstrate the defendant did use, persuade, induce, entice, and coerce knowingly that Jane was going to engage in sexually explicit conduct for the purpose of producing the video depiction of such conduct. Not only was the government's evidence of inducement and enticement lacking, the government simply failed to show that the sexually explicit conduct was for the purpose of producing the visual depiction. Second, the government failed uh, to provide that defendant knew or had reason to know that any of the videotapes would be transported in interstate or foreign commerce. In fact, the government failed to produce any evidence that the videotapes in question were transported in interstate or foreign commerce. So we've been going through this again. Did they try to take the tapes from one area to another area for the purpose of just the exploitation of it? And they did not show that proof. And this is what it was laid on the table in what we call discovery at the beginning of the process of a, of a, of a conviction. You have to have the, the access to discovery. So the prosecution was going to lay this out for us, um, in the trial. And that's what the discovery motion was for. Someone asked a very, very intellectual question. I think it was Yvette Scott. She asked the question, does Judge Lennon Weber know everything that's under seal? Well, of course, he has access to the documentation. Now, it's up to him whether he wants to read it or get to know more about it. But truthfully, he, ha he is a court examiner. So he has access to everything that, that is involved in Robert's case. Now, whether he chooses to go into it and review it or get the 411 from the court uh, examiners, that's up to him. But And I'm going to read, review that discovery and how that process works after we're done with this motion. So what are your thoughts about the enticement that was lacking in the government's testimony, which failed you know, victoriously failed to show that the sexually explicit conduct was for the purpose of producing the visual depiction. And secondly, the government failed to prove that defendant knew or had reason to know that any of the videotapes would be transported in foreign commerce or interstate. In fact, the government failed to produce any evidence that the videotapes in question were transported in interstate or foreign commerce. The government offered into evidence two videotapes, one that was in the custody of the Cook County State's attorney since 2002 under GX001-1 is origins are unknown. So they don't even know if this is the official video that was seen in 2008. And if it was um, seen in 2008, how were they showing another video that was not presented in that um, in, in that case that was found to be acquitted. And the second videotape that was produced in 2019, GX002-1, there is no evidence that either of those tapes have ever left the state of Illinois. In fact, it is undisputed that the tapes are copies made by someone, by the government, 
could, but the government could not establish where the tapes were copied or by whom. The government simply did not provide that the tapes were transported in interstate or foreign commerce. And again, this is where I go with the whole concept that if this is not the tape, then why is he being tried upon this, this evidence if this is not the specific tape and the original tape? And that was what, this is where um, I believe that they're trying to take from the information that was, was um, I guess, verified in 2008 and now plugging it into 2019. But here's the case. The case is that will this stand up in the fact that, you know, this is these are two different two different situations. And if they're going to take it based on the 2000 situation, then that is double jeopardy when they include and incorporate this new evidence in with an unknown, unknown tape, an unknown video. But that's something that the jury is going to have to figure out. I don't have that to do because I don't have enough evidence and information in front of me to even be able to make that decision, you know, rationally. So to the extent the government contends that is the images that were transported in interstate, um, specifically as to count for the evidence is wholly insufficient where no tapes exist about what images were depicted on the tape. So basically she's going on and she's saying about the tape, about the tapes. That's all it is. There's a lack of, there's a lack of evidence here. So what I want you to think about, and this is before um, we go into what Judge Lennon Weber is going to, you know, grant or deny on this motion is, is it just the tape that makes you look at this as a double jeopardy situation? Or is it just the fact that there was child pornography that was involved in the video that gives you, what do you feel about that? Just the fact that it was child pornography. That's something I want to, to uh, have you think about. Um, also, we had some really good information yesterday on the uh, video. But what I want to read now to you are the comments that was spoken yesterday. Very good comments. Um, and I feel that, let me see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that I've already done this video. <laughs> really and truly, I do. I feel I've already done this video because, um, because of the fact that we did this yesterday. Um, but what I want to share with you is some of the live discussion that took place in the video, um, as of yesterday and very, very informative. So Lennon Weber will make the ruling on the judgment granted Thursday, September 1st by 10 a.m. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, um, let me see here. Prayers are going up. You know, there's a lot of things going on in this case. Um, they didn't prove the information is what is being said here. They didn't have enough proof based upon what the prosecution promised to lay out. And the truth will prevail, Claudette says. Boss Lady Mona says, amen. It's all coming out. And then we asked the question of, with the fact that Robert was never given the opportunity to go back into the Olympia Fields house when it was sold, would that have made a change different? You know, why didn't the owner of the property more or less find the tapes? Or did they find the tapes? You know, um, let me see. Ruth says, what's done in the dark will soon come out in the light. And that's true. That's all facts. 
you know. And we ask that God intercede on behalf of Robert if this is about his freedom and he deserves to be absolutely free. And that is the key. Praying that Robert is seen out of the situation. And let me see here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mental Alchemist says this is very intense. Claudette says, I think he'll be fine on his own without all the leeches around him. We were Alma asked the question, do the judge know what's sealed? And I do believe he does, but the information can be judged upon because of the fact that, you know, everyone in the courtroom understands that prosecution brings that out, not the judge. I feel that there is light at the end of the tunnel for Robert, and that's that's awesome. That's true. So, like I said, I'm going to read to you something that I came across regarding discovery. According to Cornell Education. So when I look this question up, Brady Rule shows up. The Brady Rule named after Brady versus Maryland in 1963, requires prosecutors to disclose materially exculpatory evidence in the government's possession to the defense. So the prosecution, the prosecution lays out for the judge and defendant what they're going to do um, in the trial. So Brady material is derived um, and established a rule, a prosecution has a constitutional duty of due process to disclose material evidence. That's everything they're going to present. So if there is things under seal, no one needs to even talk about it, although the judge may actually know about it. The favorable to defendant. Later in State versus Carter case, the court found that such evidence should be, one, material to the issue and not merely cumulative or impeaching or contradictory. So we can't bring this up once, you know, the defense start slinging their dirt back at prosecution. Number two, discovered since the trial and not discoverable by the reasonable diligence beforehand. And three, of the sort that would probably change the jury's verdict if a new trial were granted. So they can't unseal these documents and include them into this trial, because if a new trial does come out, that is new evidence that could possibly be used as a new um, as new evidence. So they don't want to in infiltrate that opportunity. So in practice, if the prosecutor suppresses or fails to disclose evidence that is material to the defendant's guilty verdict or sentence, or influences the credibility of a witness, no matter whether the prosecution is of good or bad faith, intentionally or inadvertently, the defendant can use the Brady material to get a new trial. See U.S. versus Bagley. The prosecutor is not required to disclose entire files, but only impeachment and exculpatory evidence. That's weird because the impeachment clause was only for, I, I thought, presidential evidence um, or someone who's in the federal um, access of law, like uh, bodies of the government, <clears throat> like bodies of the government. To be more specific, the prosecutor has an affirmative duty to search their files and the files of law enforcement officers who work on, on the case for material evidence. As to the defendant, there are, they are required to demonstrate that if such material evidence is disclosed and used effectively, it might affect the outcome of the trial or undermine confidence in the verdict. The Brady material has three components. The evidence at issue must be favorable to the accused, either because it is exculpatory or because it is impeaching. That evidence must have been suppressed by the state, either willingly or inadvertently and prejudice must have been ensued, concluded in the uh, case. So basically now what we're looking at is how the defense has to make a prejudicial hiding of this information 
um, that has been under seal that they didn't present, um, which they had no reason to have to present. You know, so that would be if the defense was suing through an appeal process. Then at that point, I believe any documentation that was hidden in the term of the case, then at that point, it would be used for um, the ceiling. So again, that's the question that was asked to me. Um, do Lennon Weber know what's going on? Did Ann Donnelly know what was going on under the sealed documentation? I truly believe that they did. Um, they do. And I'm not 100% sure it would be up to them whether they want to look at the sealed documents or not, but I don't think there's any uh, law on the books that state that they can you know, but knowing what they know and being able to persuade the jury is a whole nother situation that could be looked at as a process of uh, appeal. So that's where we are right now. So thank you guys very much for being a part of this today. It's very short. Um, I just, I've already done a lot of research in the last couple of days. It's the holiday weekend. I'm going to be getting ready to go to be with family and friends. So I will probably not be on until Sunday. I do believe that our student is truly getting herself prepared for how she's going to discuss what she feels about this case from a historical social work standpoint position. And let me see here. So yeah, it's it's just a it's a wonderful time for me, I believe, because I think that it's gonna be victorious. Because when the devil comes in and tries to fake it to make it, you never fake it to make it. They say it even in the rooms of recovery. You don't fake it to make it because when you do, things come back to bite you because you never went through the process of practicing what was going to take place. And on top of that, a lie has to be covered with another lie in order for the lie to make sense. And you don't know how it's going to come about. You don't know how this thing is going to work. So I just wanted to say that, that, you know, to my Kelly Nation supporters, I do apologize for not having this, you know, willfully thought out. I just wanted to come on to inform you about that motion and put that out there. So thank you all so much for liking, commenting, and subscribing to this podcast. And uh, if you, you know, find anything helpful here, please make sure that you leave it in the comment box. You know, um, it's just, there's a lot. And the only thing I'm waiting for is the appeal. So I hope you're doing the same thing. I hope you have a great, wonderful holiday. I'm going to leave about five minutes in the chat for you to say anything you want to say. Um, thank you so much. And as always, keep it 100 and have a blessed day. And we'll see you next time.